Hey, welcome to the Screenwriting Life. I'm Meg LaFauve. And I'm Lorianne McKenna. We are professional screenwriters. We've worked together as a team and separately. We've worked on studio and indie films, live action and animation, from my work on Inside Out and Captain Marvel. To my work in Pixar's story department on Up, Brave, and Inside Out. We are here to share our insights on the craft of screenwriting and also the life. How to not only survive the ups and downs, but thrive. We want to help you become the best screenwriter you can be and to reassure you that you are not alone on this journey. All right, you guys, thanks for coming back and uh, hanging out with us again today. We are still home riding out Corona. And uh, this week on the show, we're going to be talking about how to work with producers. All right, but before our topic, we're going to talk about our week or what we like to call Adventures in screenwriting. <laughs> I love that title. Um, so, uh, Meg, how was your week? Oh, I go first. You want to go, go first? first? I can I'll go, go first. first. I will go first. Okay. Um, I had one of those weeks. I'm I'm split into too many different things. I'm going in too many directions, so I feel like I'm I'm doing them all poorly. Um, but uh, I'm I, so, I'm laughing because I yeah, that resonates with me, not because I'm laughing, laughing at you, Lorian. Sorry. Um, I have a lot of chatter in my head. Um, uh, you know, so I, I've, t- I've taken to run walking, well, walk and then a little bit of run because I can't run, but um, it helps get my body going. And then I'm also able to just start thinking about the story as I run, which I don't know, some reason mm-hmm. working out helps me calm it all down. And um, this was for a project that I'm trying to get. And uh, I was thinking about the antagonist and all of a sudden running, he was like talking to me and shape shifting and he was, it was, it was an interesting experience. I hadn't had that before where letting during exercise, which I hate, uh, I was able to access story in a way that I hadn't before. So that was kind of interesting. Um, you know, but then I, what I really need to do when I get into this state of, of too much in my head mm-hmm. in terms of story and what am I doing is just get it on a piece of paper and just start chunking it out. Even if it stinks and I don't know, I just really have to get back into the actual chunking it out. And um, I had a really super fun thing, which is I did a Zoom with a Girl Scout troop from the little tiny, tiniest ones to brownies to Girl Scouts. Um, They are getting a badge because they're doing Pixar in a box. Oh, um, what's what's Pixar in a box? Pixar in a box is something you can do online where you learn about Pixar and I think how the process works and you go and do different lessons. And um, so it was super fun. And what was amazing about it is those kids, those girls asked the best questions I've ever been asked about. Wow. Out. <laughs> really? Because, because there's no filter. There's no, they're not worried if it's a good question. They're not worried about how to phrase it. They're not worried about what you think. They literally are just like, I want to know this in the best way. Like I've been right. interviewed for years about Inside Out, right? Top interviewers. These were by far the best questions. When there were questions like, um, I wrote one down like, you know, what from your childhood do you use for inspiration and inside out? Like, but they really wanted to know, like specifically, you as a kid, tell me the scene or like, did you ever get frustrated making the movie? (laughs) No. Right? Never. Never. That's such a, such a wonderfully open, like, you know, right down into the heart of it question or, you know, this is my favorite, Lorian. Was there anything you'd change about the movie? No. (laughs) It's done. (laughs) <laughs> their questions were so honest that they bring up a yes. lot of my vulnerability right like yes. it, was, it was kind of but it was great I was just so impressed by them um and then lastly I started a new project because why not <laughs> um no but this is a job job it's a big job uh, I just started on Monday and I'm really excited it's super fun to be in the blue sky stage yes where you are just it could be this it could be that it could be this and you're like let's go research let's research yay let's research and research means literally researching this topic but it also means watching movies that could possibly be in the genre is that the genre what is that genre let's look at you know and I'm watching films now like with my analyst you know brain on where I'm stopping it and I type and I'm typing as I go along and I'm writing things like oh that's how they're doing it like I'm I'm looking at the math. I don't even know if I'm going to use any of this math, but it helps me like, and I'm trying to catch up because there is a director on the project and I'm catching up to him. And um, so it's fun. I, I, it's interesting though, to look at myself and realize as a writer, there's some piece of me that is like, why aren't you writing? Why Mm -hmm. aren't you writing? Like I have this because, but I have to do all this research. I have to get into the pool 
right? Yeah. So I know what to write. Um, but I do find it slightly anxiety making that I'm not writing yet. Um, right. I think my brain. I, well, congratulations. I think that's Thank awesome. You. And I'm glad you're having fun. And I think that that's, a, that's worth talking about is what is writing, okay. right? Sometimes, uh, you know, going for a walk is doing the work. Sometimes lying on your bed face down is doing the work, right? Because you're processing and you're, um, you have to get to the point where you're actually typing or writing it down. But that stuff is writing. It is the work of, to get there. Um, but so, my type A personality, I have to get straight A's. Like, I don't know, like that part of me starts to like, what are you doing? What we should be writing, just start writing. Um, but I don't, I know that the, the higher part of me knows it's not time yet. I just have to, I have right. to um, ruminate in it. I have to cure into this um, entire new project. Uh, well, I have some advice. Uh, this is producer Jeff. There's this great podcast I listen to called The Screenwriting Life. And uh, <laughs> last week, the two of them talked about sometimes you need to get up from your desk and walk around. So I really encourage you guys to check that show out. It's great. <laughs> sure. Okay. I'll give it a listen. <laughs> yes, we can't take our own advice. It's what Jeff is saying. Right? Right, like, I'm, <laughs> I, out. I'm not taking my own advice. Okay, Marion. Well, and I, I'm saying, I'm like, you know, it's the work, it's the writing. And then I'm like, but God, if I spend a whole day doing something that's not actually typing, then I feel like I haven't done the work too. So it's, you know, I don't, I don't know how to it's take part my of the advice. Process. Yes. The anxiety about it is oddly part of the process. Yes. Um, uh, my, my uh, psychiatrist recently told me that I have anxiety about my anxiety. And I feel like that's part of this, right? Like, you have anxiety about the process and the process makes you anxious. And like, it's just this circular thinking that it's can so blow you out. It's fun. Oh my but, gosh, it's so yeah. Fun. I mean, I have fraud syndrome about my fraud syndrome and anxiety about my anxiety. So like, <laughs> I so am a delight. Complex. You are so complex. <laughs> so complex. Um, so uh, my week, um, I was really busy this week. Um, I worked a lot on this animated project that I'm uh, show running and we are getting ready to take the pitch out, which I'm so excited about. Um, I love the project. I love the writer and the studio that we're working with. Um, but what's happening right now is that the pitch is getting there. I'd say like it's 80% done, but we're in this place now where we have to launch artists to do concept art on it. And um, that means showing work that's incomplete and sort of trusting that what we hand out to the artist will still be true when the artist delivers the original work back because who knows, we could crack something amazing while the artist is working. And that's a part of animation. You have to you know, get other um, channels going. You can't just be locked in script. And I think in live action, you have actors in mind, but you get the cast after you sell it or you attach an actor to it before you sell it. But this is literally, we have to come up with character design as we're developing the story and the character. So it's it's scary and a little bit stressful. And I just have to, you know, and hold on. And those used to it though, right? Are, are, I'm used I, to I, it. I really like it, but the artists themselves, if, if you came back and said, oh, yes. no, we changed it. They're, they're fine. Yeah, I mean, they, they know in animation. I mean, and in an animated pitch, you really do need to bring artwork. I've been asked this question um, several times and yes, you need to bring artwork for an animated pitch, for an animated show. Um, but yeah, so I know it and the artist knows it and everybody knows it, but it's still, you know, yeah. it's still it's still scary. Um, but I'm really excited about what we're doing. Um, the other thing, Meg, you and I were working on our project together, which I love and it's super fun. Um, and then I spent, I have this original idea that I'm working on a pitch for it as a TV show. And I got to spend a couple hours on it this week and I was so excited. And in the middle of working on it, I got a call that um, someone's interested in hearing the pitch because I did a soft pitch of it at a general. So it was almost sort of like, did I manifest this by actually doing the work? Oh um, because, because I'm that powerful. So let's just all agree that I'm that powerful. Um, but it was, it was really like, oh, great. Yeah, now I have even more reason to focus on it and do it. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm in this place too, where I'm struggling with the chatter and I'm struggling with the situation and like the work and the family and taking care of myself. And I've let the taking care of myself take a way back seat. Like I'm barely exercising. I don't even know what I'm eating. So I, I need to change that, you know, because I'm not going to be as good a, you know, wife, mom, dog owner, writer, 
as I can be unless I'm able to take care of myself. And it's just the first thing that falls away for me, right? So yeah, I've been- most people, I think it's the first thing to go. I mean, I heard whether it's true or not, I don't know, but I heard you literally only have so much willpower per day. And yeah. you know, right now, most of mine is going to homeschooling right now, yeah. almost all of it. So yeah. the willpower to not eat the cookie, like that's way down. <laughs> like there's no way I right. could do that. And I told my daughter's teachers that I would not be doing homeschooling anymore. Like I just, because I have to work, you know, I, ha that's where my willpower has to go. Like get my butt in the seat and write. And that's where it's going right now. And so I have to figure out how to find a better balance so that I do do a little bit of homeschooling. So my child isn't, you know, completely lost. Um, but that balance is on my mind. The ch part of the chatter is, am I doing enough? I'm doing too much. You know, that sort of. When I realized I'm taking all that type A stuff into the homeschooling where I'm probably doing too much. I'm probably even pushing him too hard because I want to get the right answers, which is like so dumb. <laughs> like what, what, what's the right answer? There's like, he has to learn this. Right. Um, so it's that whole process too of, of my, of, you know, it's so interesting. Like everything you do can evolve you, right? If you let it, like, it's like, okay, Meg, what are you doing? Like, what does he really need to get out of this? Right. Um, so, but you know, then I get tired. <laughs> <laughs> and you eat the cookie. And I eat the cookie. And that, true story, the end. True yeah. story, the end. Yeah. But um, uh, something exciting that happened for our show is we have um, someone helping us out with the Facebook page, Andrew Justra, who's amazing. Andrew. 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 Yay. And Andrew, I worked with him on a couple of projects and he's a writer and a creator and um, so he's going to be helping us with the Facebook page. So hopefully we will be able to start putting up some of the stuff that we have been promising to put up, but I'm, I'm really excited about that. It's yeah. happening. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, talking about the Facebook page and our email and we love getting posts and we love getting emails, but I do just want to let everybody know this is a serious part of our podcast today. This is a legal thing. Um, <laughs> and, um, just, I wrote this. So this is not like a, from a lawyer, but here we go. Uh, for legal reasons, please don't send us scripts, books, story proposals, or details about a story or script you're working on. We can answer general questions about craft and process and you know personal experience, but we can't get into the details about your story in any way, and we'll need to delete those emails without reading them. This is legally to protect us, to protect you. Uh, don't send us original story ideas. Very, just the normal common pol yeah. policy around Hollywood. You can't just call up and start talking to people about your ideas because uh, it's legally uh, precarious to do that yes. for everybody. Um, all right, so um, of course, Lauren and I want to skip the next part, Jeff, but- uh, we'll, we'll keep it quick. Um, um, we do just want to say thanks to everyone. We we're just talking about the community on Facebook. We're so excited to have Andrew on the team now. And um, again, I mentioned every week, but that was the goal of this show. It's not only relay information from some wonderful experts, but to build a community let you all find each other too. It's just um, writers need writers. And that's what part of this podcast is about. And uh, we just wanted to say thank you and acknowledge some of the beautiful reviews that you guys have written. And just quickly know that these reviews really help to um, grow the show and optimize people's ability to find the show. And because our goal is to grow this community, sending those reviews really helps other people find the show. So I'm going to write a beautifully written review from Abibi real quick, who says, this is like a writer's group. The screenwriting podcast differs from others I've listened to. Yes, Meg and Lorraine talk about their process, but they approach the discussion in a way that feels like it's entirely for the listener's benefit. I feel like they're completely on my team. Everything they say is personal and honest. Where else can you hear a writer tell you about occasionally overwhelming anxiety? I mean, that discussion felt like they were right in the room talking directly to me. And I love that they welcome questions either on their Facebook page or by email. This podcast is awesome and I'm a devoted fan for life for as long as they do it, which is hopefully a very long time. Thank you. Thank you. That's so nice. Yes, we are right there with you. Honest mm -hmm. to God, we are right down in the foxhole with you. Yeah. Um, which, and then, Lauren, really, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Glad Lauren, you had one from uh, Jonathan Fernandez you wanted to read. Uh, yeah. To get an idea for the rest of the community. Yeah. He said he loved the last podcast and um, he had a thought that what helps. Uh, this is from Jonathan writing. What helps me and my students when we have writer's block is research. If you're writing about the mafia, go to the mafia social club. If you're writing about mythology, read books about ancient myths. If you're writing about some psychological pathology, read the DSM. Um, does anyone have a copy of the DSM? That'd be amazing. You can Google um, it. Oh, oh, cool. 
Uh, it's really the corollary to the old writer's advice, write what you know. If you're having trouble writing, it might be because you have nothing to say. You need to be the expert on whatever topic you're writing about. So go out and research and topic to the point of exhaustion, which I think is great advice, but, we, but with caution. With caution. It is great advice. Research is a great way to break writer's block. Um, the caution is just, it can also be a way to avoid uh, yes. actually going and writing. Right. Um, uh, and the only one who knows that is you, right? That you know, if you're doing that, you just have to get super honest. I mean, the truth is anything can be used for good or to avoid, <laughs> right? Yes. You can outline forever because you're too afraid to go to draft. You can just barf draft forever because you don't actually want to go and do the, so all of those things are great things, right? You can bring people together to read and get notes, which you can just keep doing because you don't actually want to break through and be like, oh, I have to do it all over, right? So every positive thing, every tool in your toolbox, you can use to push yourself or you can use it uh, to avoid. So just, you know, the only person, you just have to know yourself and when you're getting into that zone. Yep. Um, what's next? Oh, so let's, uh, get into our topic for the week. Topic. We need like is... neat topic music coming on. <laughs> is that a sting? We need a sting. Yeah, a sting. Uh, oh, oh <laughs> Thanks, there's Jeff. our, there's our topic sting. You're uh, welcome. <laughs> so, uh, we're talking about working with a producer. Uh, we yeah. got quite a few questions about this and Meg and I have both been producers and have worked with producers. So I think we have an interesting perspective on it. Yeah, both sides, which is good and challenging, I think, because you sort of see all, and we're both Libras, right? So we both see all points of view, yeah. right? Both sides. Um, so Meg, you wanna share your thoughts first? We can talk um, about it. You know, uh, there's all different kinds of producers, first of all, right? So there's producers who are line producers and they're literally making the movie. They're budgeting, they're on set. Um, Generally, writers don't interact with the line producers. Um, again, TV, you will because you're running the show. But right now, we're talking about features. So, um, but if you are, uh, you know, uh, in TV and line producing, you kind of need to know budget and that kind of stuff. But we can talk about that if you're interested, or bring in a big TV person to talk about it. Um, and the other kind of producers and features, of course, um, there are producers out there who are just really good at getting the rights to IP, and that's how they make their living: is they get a lot of rights and then they then sell those to other studios. There's, there's producers out there who are really, really good at cast, meaning movie stars. They're great schmoozers. They are great at a party. People always invite them. People like to hang out with them. Um, that's a huge, huge skill. They tend to actually have you know, other producers working with them because that you know, uh, access to cast is such a powerful thing to have. Um, and then there's the producers that I think we're talking about, right? Which are the creative producers, right? Who are the producers who, I mean, there's other producers, right? Who just love the deal, right? They just love setting stuff up. And, but we're talking about creative producers who are really there working with the, the writer, you, um, in that kind of more day-to-day -day development way. Um, you know, any producer that you're going to, and then there's the producer, are you working for them? They brought you a project and you're working for them? Or is this somebody that you have gone into partnership with on an original idea of yours, right? Or is there IP? You know, the first thing I have to say, you know, danger, Will Robinson, warning, warning, warning. If a producer comes to you and you're a younger writer or an emerging writer, and they say, I have this IP, I'd like to hire you for free probably to write the script, the first thing you have to ask is, do you have the rights? And get proof that they have the rights. Because there's a lot of people around town who have IP that they don't have the rights to. And that is a dangerous road because you could write an amazing script and there is nothing you can do with it because there's no underlying rights. And listen, you might wanna do that just for the practice, but you should go in eyes wide open to the risk you're taking if that producer doesn't have the IP rights. Um, and and how you, somebody else has it. That's right. And how you get proof is you, um, there's lots of entertainment lawyers around town that will work for hourly. 
right? The normal setup for entertainment lawyers is, you know, you sort of connect with them like an agent or a manager and they take a certain percentage of what you make. But there are lawyers who will just work for you. Hey, can you help me find out who has the rights to this? Or someone else's manager might do it for you as a favor. Um, there are ways to figure that out. And it's really, or you can really, call, it's a book. You can call, you can call and ask the publisher them. and ask, yeah. are the rights taken? And they should tell you by who, even just a name. Um, so you really have to be careful about that. That's a little scamo that happens to young writers all the time. Again, you might decide to go for it because you just want the experience, but go in eyes wide open. I mean, most likely you're, you, you have, you're working with somebody, um, and they're giving you notes, right? They're the ones who are going to be the go-between between between you and the studio. And often if they're great directors, I mean, sorry, producers, that's awesome because they hopefully know that studio. They know what they're wanting. They know those executives for years and years and years. Their, their knowledge and breadth of the, of the marketplace and of the business and how it works is what's guiding you as a writer through that process. There can be times when what they want is not what the studio wants. So I think that's rare. It can happen and it's a bit of a bummer when it happens because they've been working with you and you write towards A and the studio wants you know W. Um, but I don't think it happens that often. Generally, I think really good producers um, know their stuff um, and uh, and you should really take their notes very seriously and their thoughts and how they want to um, set up the project, right? Um, you know, I would also say if you take a check from a producer for your work, they now own it. So if they want to turn your pair of loafers into high-heeled platform zebra shoes, they can. You took the check and you cashed it. So just know that too, like this is a business and you're entering into a business um, partnership as well as a creative partnership. So before I ever would give handover rights to anybody, I'd sit with them for a couple of times and who are they taking it to? What, who, what other movie comps do they see that this is like? Um, you know, who would they cast in it if they could? What kind of director would they put on it? That's gonna tell you the movie they see in your script. That makes sense what I'm saying? Like that, that, yep. that, that these scripts are blueprints at some point and they could be seeing a whole other thing that they wanna do with it. And again, if you're a young writer, you're probably gonna take that chance, right? Because it, you gotta get on the board, but at least don't get upset when it changes because that producer told you what they were gonna do. And it is a rite of passage to be taken advantage of by a producer. <laughs> <laughs> so sad. It's sad, but you learn in that process what to look out for in the future, right? Um, and it's asking those questions. It's asking other people who've worked with that producer. It's doing your homework a little bit. Um, but again, you, you weigh the risk because sometimes it'll work out great. And there are lots of people who are trustworthy and honest and ethical and- And uh, artists in their own right. Like don't yes. think that producers are just business men or women. They are artists and most of them, now listen, Right now in the business, to be an independent producer is practically impossible because there's no way to make money. It used to be back in the dark ages, dark ages when I came to Hollywood, <laughs> they would get a development fee. They don't anymore. So right. they don't make any money until the thing is greenlit. And the percentage of films that actually get greenlit is so small, right? It's super hard to be any kind of independent producer and earn a living, right? So a lot of them you know, there's, you know, the joke around town is trust fund babies, right? Because that's how you could possibly be an independent producer is you have a trust fund. A lot of them come out of other disciplines. I, they come up from line producers or they were an executive. So they have, so they can get a deal or they know enough people around town to get things set up. Right. Or they've gotten money from China or different, like they're, they have to find their own ways to finance their themselves and that, that they have time to give you notes. Remember you're one of many right? Projects. That doesn't mean they don't love you. That doesn't mean they don't believe in you, but be smart. You got a window. You just do, right? That window might be three years. That window might be six months. I don't know. How big are they? How many projects do they have, right? And by that window, I mean, they're like, oh my gosh, this is a movie, which is of course, like we've said in past podcasts, that's the thing you want to get. You want some producer to say to you, this is a movie, right? Creatively, we can talk about what that means. Um, but they, you know, 
how many drafts uh, will you be paid to do before they're like, maybe it's not a movie. <laughs> I'm just being honest with you guys. That can happen, right? right. You got to give it your best shot when you've got the, their focus and attention um, on you. Right. So pr practically speaking, if you get a producer who's attached to a studio or an independent producer, you can engage with them without any money changing hands. And the idea is that you're both working speculatively in right. partnership to take it to a buyer and then you get paid when it sells. The other way is that the producer is going to pay you to work on it. Then they own it. Then if you are asked not to continue on the project, they own the work that you did. Whereas right. if you did it speculatively and you separate and part ways and it doesn't sell, you get, you retain the rights to your creative material. Even, and I don't, this one is a little murky, like even the notes that the producer gave you on it, like how far you went in development. Yeah, it's a little murky. We There's, put the lawyer on. Yeah. But, yeah. You, know, you know, and the other thing is, I just forgot because I literally said the word lawyer and I was like, oh my God, we can't be giving legal advice. <laughs> <laughs> my brain, I just blew my brain up. Um, you know, uh, I have to say in terms of if you're, a, 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 if you're in the Writers Guild, you are not supposed to give free drafts, right? So let's say a studio is paying you to write you aren't supposed to be doing 10 drafts with the producer before it goes into the studio. So I have to say that like, that is, the, that is the deal with the writer's guild. It is also just practical to get insight from the producer before you go in because they're your producer and they're your, you know, I think that's a, it's, it's a hard thing. Um, I, I want my producer to give me notes. I want, I have the right, of course, as a writer's guild member to take those notes or not because it's not an official draft. Um, but you know, that's, that, that can also be tricky waters too, right there. Right. I think working out a relationship with your producer, sort of all the things you talked about, like taste, are we on the same page? Do we see the same big picture for this project, but also how are we going to work together? Right? Mm -hmm. Like what's your turnaround for notes, right? Some people get a script and then they need a week to read it before they're going to even get get you feedback, sort of setting up what those expectations are so that you are not thinking something should be happening that isn't happening. So you don't create undue, unnecessary anxiety for yourself. Right. Um, um, but, but also um, you talk to like, here's how I like to give no get notes. You know, you get to say what you like too. Um, and then when you do get notes, um, there's, we've talked about this in our first podcast, how to take notes is, not being combative or defensive when getting the notes, even if it's something you desperately will not change about that, right? Because this is a really important relationship. This person is gonna you know, open doors for you, is gonna get you in the room and they wanna keep working with you. So be collaborative and figure out how then to respond to those notes. So like take a day, take two days. Usually you, know, you get notes and you say, great, I'll look into that. Let me think about that. Let me think about that, right? And then you ask don't... questions. If you really don't like it, just be like, okay, so how would that work? Or what do you mean by this? Like dig mm -hmm. out that note a little bit more. You may not be actually getting the notes, right? right. Some producers are great at giving notes and some are not. That's yes. the other thing to watch out for. Some yes. are not great at giving notes. And then I'm sorry, it becomes your job as the writer to dig it out by mm -hmm. asking lots of questions, right? Mm -hmm. What you mm -hmm. want to get to is... In that meeting, because you've asked questions and you're digging it out of them, all of a sudden you're like, you mean like this? And, he's, and that producer might go, or like that. And suddenly you're spitballing, whether you use any of that spitball or not. That's to me the exciting point when you start going, it could be this, it could be that. You might not get there in that meeting. It might be the second meeting or later, but you do have to take their notes, even if it's just, here's why that didn't work. You said you wanted this, that didn't work because of this, but here's what did work. And I think that does answer the note because of that. Right. Yes. You have to respect their notes. They've been in the business a long time. They've read a lot more scripts than you. They probably they have done. They've down. They've gone down this road of making movies. They know stuff that's going to happen to your script that you have no idea about. They understand about actors. They understand about directors. They understand about studios. Because who's going to be there when you're long gone? Who's going to be in the marketing meeting? Who's going to be in the meeting with the studio? Who's going to be on set dealing with the actors? That producer. And that's why you guys have to be in agreement about what this movie is, because that's what, if they love that, that's what they're protecting through the process, mm -hmm. right? That doesn't mean that occasionally producers uh, 
don't have to let writers go and get another writer. I mean, that can also happen, you guys. Another rite of passage is being fired. That just is, guys. <laughs> it just is. Yes. And you have to be a big, you know, person about it because the producer doesn't probably want to fire you either. But, and it's not being fired. It's such a hard word, right? And it is being fired, but sometimes as a writer, you're tapped out too. Like you're literally tapped out. Like I, I cannot write this again. I don't know what you want. Maybe they do need fresh blood to come in and see it a different way and not have all the tentacles attached, right? Um, and that is just part of the process. You, it hurts, you know, take your time. And my advice is get to the next, just go to the next. Yeah. I know it's hard, but everybody's been fired. Everybody. 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 And and there's also a piece too of knowing what your boundaries are. It can feel like when you're just starting out and there's a producer interested in your project and you're working, like I have to do everything I can to hold on to this. So I'll do everything they ask of me, free work, more drafts. But, but there is a point where you do need to understand your value and your boundaries and communicate them in a human, decent way. Like here's, here's what I'm, and it's really hard because it's you putting a stake in the ground and saying, I'm worth you can't keep taking advantage of me, right? Like, let's figure out what, is there a deal to be made here? Or are you going to finally pay me for this? But it, that's not what you want to say. Are you going to finally pay me for this? That's <laughs> literally not a script you should say. But um, there is a point where you get fatigue on a project. You can feel like it's not working out, sort of figuring out how to get to the next step or parting ways sometimes. So you could be the one to pull the, pull the trigger to. And learning how to do that gracefully without making anyone mad and, you know, keeping doors open. Um, that's another mistake. I mean, I've made it where you, it's not working on a project and you need to get off it and not understanding how to manage those relationships and to do that. And so then it's like this sort of wound out there, you know, cause this is a very small industry and you will be seeing the same people over and over again. So like figuring out how to know your worth, put your boundaries down without burning bridges. It is a very, very tricky part of being a writer. And possible. You can totally do it. You can yes. totally do it, you guys. Um, it's about treating people with respect. Mm -hmm. They may not be treating you with respect, but you have to be respectful while you have your boundary. And, you know, a producer comes to a writer and they're kind of like, oh my God, I have to tell them some hard stuff. This We're going to blow it up. I, I ooh, like, oh, like we're going to blow it up. And they're trying to do it in a supportive way. But if you have big reactions and are like, fuck you, or, you know, dig in your heels, I don't know how many times are they going to come back to you? They really believe it has to be blown up. I think you have to take the time at least a week and blow it up. You guys, you got your old script over there. Just see what they're trying to say. You might find out they're wrong, but I promise you, you'll discover something that is essential to go back and that you're in this partnership of give and take, right? So, um, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Um, some of the producers I've worked with have now become very dear friends, if not best friends, because it's also an intimate, vulnerable experience, right? To have that person be giving you notes and you changing and they have to, the best ones hold your hand and walk you into the lava. Those are the best creative producers. They understand it. They are artists themselves. They understand the business, but they also understand what this takes and that they're there to make you feel safe safe enough to walk into the lava, right? Yes, there are bad producers who do not make you feel safe, but we're talking that the goal is to find the producer who really makes you feel safe. They want something from you for sure, right? But that you're willing to go and risk and try again and again is what they, they want you to do that. They want you to break it, go ahead and break it so that they can see, oh yeah, no, that did break it. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, shit, that broke it, go back, go back, right? right. Um, so you just, you have to trust them. And, and if you have trust issues, I don't know who that could be. Um, you know, just that, eat the cookie. Eat the cookie. Eat the cookie it's fine. and evolve. Just go <laughs> ahead and evolve. Um, but, you know, like Lorian saying, be smart about it, right? Have your boundaries, take care of yourself before you, you know, as you know, as you learn who this person is, right? And then in TV, if you're the creator of the show, um, you can, um, if, if you like, say you sell a pitch, but you're not experienced in TV, they may attach a showrunner to the show with well, you will. or, or say you don't want to be a showrunner, you, you know, and so they'll attach a showrunner and that's a different kind of relationship, a creative. So I'm doing this right now. I'm show running a show that someone else has written. So we're partners on it. So 
it's, it's another level of, you know, I'm being a creative producer on this project, but also a writer, right, in some ways. So, um, but sort of that is a whole different kind of relationship than a feature because you're, you're on a TV show and you have to sort of manage all that together. And in that sort of relationship, what's working for me is I check in with the writer on the project, like, how involved do you want to be in this? Right. And then she tells me. Right. And then I can, I keep checking in with her. So being honest about what you really want and how you want to grow and finding a producing partner who's going to help you get there, I think is also a big part of it. Um, and you're going to, I know that everybody right now is like, well, how do I find that producer? How do I find that? <laughs> you know, that's what all of them are thinking right now. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, you know, every producer friend of mine right now is going to be like, don't say that, but you can always send query letters to producers. You look at who, who produced that movie, which is the movie that is your comp, and they, you look at their list, come on, it's not like the 80s or 90s where you couldn't find any information about anybody, just get on IMDb Pro and there's all their credits, right? In terms of, they're all, producers are always out there looking for product, right? So um, you can send query letters to producers. Um, listen, I'm not saying it's like the magic fairy dust and suddenly, but you never know, right? Um, and it's, uh, then always comes back in Hollywood to six degrees of separation, right? It's somebody's aunt's, you know, niece knows somebody to read it. Right. And, and getting, you know, you, you should try to get feedback. If you're going to get into partnership with a producer, I would ask who else they've worked with that you can call and get recommendations because yes. this is a marriage of sorts and it's legally yes. a marriage. If you're going to actually give rights over, you should talk to other people who have worked with that person. Yeah. And I think it's again, like query letters are great, but also talk and the six degrees of separation, talk about what you want to do with people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I taught my daughter that when we make a wish, we don't keep it to ourselves, right? We, we tell, she, so she tells me her wishes because how else can I help her make her dreams come true if I don't know what they are, mm -hmm. right? So uh, tell people what your wishes and your dreams and your hopes are because you never know when someone might be like, oh, right, I heard this person I know, this producer is looking for a project just like that. And then you can get connected. That's so, great advice because a lot of times when you're a young writer or, or any writer of any level, you go on things called general meetings where your agent or manager or best friend has set you up with a producer uh, who they think you'll click creatively, you'll like the same things. And you go in and you should have two, three ideas to pitch. They could be half ideas, things you're thinking about. But really what happens in those meetings is what Lorian's talking about where stuff that you're just curious about, it could be about why do people do this? Or I love these kinds of wor worlds, or I loved this movie. That's how they really start to get to know you. Mm -hmm. And that's when they're like, oh my God, I love that movie too. And I wish we could come up with a movie like this. Like, and suddenly this thing starts happening between you. And this is the kind of relationship you want where you're all on the same page. You both like the same things, but um, that's vulnerable, right? You have to go in and open up your heart and show them who you are and what you love and what you're curious about and what you want. Exactly what Lorian's saying. Totally yeah. agree, 1000%. So tell people your wishes. Don't keep them to yourself. <laughs> I think quickly, if I could jump in um, to jump off what Meg's saying, I think I mentioned a couple weeks ago, I've been writing something that's like very, very low budget with the hopes of possibly trying to shoot it. Very limited ensemble, limited feature, limited location feature. And I've actually talked to a couple producers and um, I told Lori to Meg at the top, I just came off a note session with, with one that makes me feel very much in ISOC mode right now. So <laughs> Maybe I'll just set the feature on fire and never write again. Um, but no, we're getting you over to They Suck. Come on. Get I know, I've got to get there. Get um, how, but, how dare they is how, how dare you get they. there. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> it's interesting. With this producer, I, I um, was noticing a lot of the references I had for the feature were like movies or writers they didn't know at all. So like I mentioned the Duplass brothers. I mentioned Joe Swanberg. I mentioned The Big Chill, which is partly an influence on the script. I mentioned Genji Cohan. And this producer didn't know any of this work. And so part of me is like, we probably just don't have the same taste. And there was part of me that thought, you know, these are pretty big names in development. If this producer isn't aware of these, these uh, big names in our industry, they're probably not right for the project. Great, they probably are not. Unless yeah. they're a line producer, right? That's different. Right. They're gonna actually mm -hmm. run the sets and then, right? But um, yeah, uh, yeah, great, no, great insight. No, they yeah. don't get what you're doing. Yeah. So that is giving me a little piece to move towards. They suck and then eventually I'll be fine. <laughs>
congratulations thank you you're guys doing it oh, you're doing you. the work I'm over until they suck okay next step what's next got to get you there yeah yeah it's stuck all right should we um do our question do our question all right uh i have it right here uh oh we love reading the questions and interacting with everyone on uh the screenwriting life at gmail.com uh we got a uh um sorry what is the word? What are words? Words. It's a question oh, from Rebecca Flanagan. And uh, she said, what do you do when you are being repped by the wrong manager? I have been in this uh, situation for the past many years and have found that I'm paralyzed with fear about firing this manager and no longer being repped, especially in this tumultuous time, as well as suffering the consequences of this manager's wrath and potentially having this writer's reputation smeared, right? Um, but what I really loved about her question is then she went into the lava and really said, you know, there has to be a better professional relationship out there than this current one. Surely all managers aren't verbally abusive, dismissive, engage in gaslighting, and refuse to read scripts of certain genres. And so immediately my response is, yes, you should go. Go. Right? Like, go. There is such a thing as a toxic relationship. Yes. Right? Now, I will say, Rebecca not to play, um, you know, therapist, but you might have this relationship in other areas of your life as well, right? Generally, we keep getting into the same relationship because we haven't learned the lesson. So it might help to know what to do. If you go and look at this, think of, think of it as a writer, right? This manager is an archetype, right? If you were going to write this manager, she is an archetype. She is probably a bit of a predator, right? And she, how does this predator work? And what is she putting on her face versus how she lures you in? What is her bait, right? What is she using you for? What does she need you for? Then go look at other people in your life and wonder, hey, that's just like my great aunt Sally that I stayed with that summer or whatever. Because again, sometimes these are very personal things. Like, is it just you thinking that she's doing these things? Probably not. I think she's probably doing them. Um, so in terms of the business of it, um, both Lorian and I did ask our managers because we wanted to make sure to give you good information. Lorian, what did your manager say about leaving one manager to find another? He said that managers uh, don't, there's a code of conduct among them. I don't, I don't know if it's official, but they won't meet with people who are repped by other people. You need to separate from your current management in order to go out and be read by other people. Um, and he was very clear that that's what he does. If he hears that there's someone who's looking, he'll say, well, who are you repped by? And okay, well, when you don't have that relationship anymore, I'll read you. And he acknowledged that how scary that is, right? Not to be repped in that in-between place. But, you know, as a, you have to believe in yourself, right? You have to believe that you're going to get meetings and going to be read. So it's really scary, but. It, it is scary. My manager said the same. He did say that recently over the last few years, there are younger managers who are breaking this code, but he said he would not do it. Same for my manager. So I think there yeah. it does exist. Um, in terms of the scary bit, I totally agree with Lorian. It's about believing in yourself. It doesn't make it less scary, of course. Um, but here's the thing. I do believe toxic relationships can cost more life energy and cause more problems than just not having one, right? Like you really have to wonder, right, what it's costing you to, for this person to be putting doubts into your head, to make you feel small, to make your writing not feel right or good, right? That, that, that the value, that your value is in question, that is not a good relationship to be in. It just isn't. I mean, at some point, you know, we can all say, well, what if this person could make us a million dollars? Well, maybe, but probably not because they, they are, this is how, what their behavior is to you, right? And I have to tell you, my manager and my agent you know, the reason I love them and, and will be loyal to the day I die is because always the first thing they say is, what do you want? I, they're there to help me get my dream, that wish that Lorraine's talking about saying, that is what your manager and agent should be asking you about. What is your great wish? What is gonna make you happy and satisfied as an artist? Where artistically do you wanna go? And then my job is to match that and figure out how are we gonna do that? What's the short-term goals? What are the long-term goals, right? That doesn't mean they're not gonna have a hard conversations with you about, listen, that doesn't make any money, <laughs> right? Yeah. So therefore, 
how are you going to earn money while you're doing that thing that's not going to make you any money or the market isn't looking for that right now or whatever because that is also their job their job is to know all that stuff and communicate it to you but it's a it's a back and forth conversation where you're trying to find the sweet spot between that dream between the artist you're realizing you are right and what the market is and that's their job their job is to take this artist and find the market for them not mold the artist to the market Right. Right. And I know that, that, and you know, I don't know, maybe managers are going to be like, yes, of course we do that. Of course we mold artists to the market. But I just think that's a pretty tricky thing because there's movies I love that I can't write. Right. You write what you write. Right. And that should, it doesn't mean you shouldn't try lots of genres and you shouldn't try to write lots of stuff. You should, especially if you're young, try everything. You never know. Right. Push yourself. But in terms of a business relationship, I, I really want for you, Rebecca, to have somebody who knows how good you are and how value you, valuable you are and how lucky they are to have you in their stable, how lucky yes. they are, right? And that they want to speak to you about your dreams and they want to give you the hard, cold facts of the business, but just to build something together, right? I mean, there are people out there who aren't that. Uh, they are predators. They are people who get their value and ego off of making you feel small. Right. And they think it, they tell you it's like, well, that's the hard truth of Hollywood and all that stuff, right? Yeah. No, yeah. guys, I'm telling you. Lorraine so, and I can tell you there's other people out there. Yeah. So in this space of I'm in this toxic, what sounds like a little bit of an abusive relationship, um, as you move toward separating with this person, write down, work really hard on what you do want in a rep. No, that's uh, so I just did a transition from one rep to another. Um, my rep, my manager moved into producing, so it was a little different. Um, but Meg, you sent me, I don't know if you remember this, you sent me this really beautiful list that I think someone in the WGA came up with of a form to fill out, like all the things I want with a manager. What is a phone call like with this manager? How do they talk to me? You know, what kinds of work do we do together? Sort of like the dream, my dream manager and sort of articulating that instead of focusing on, I don't want someone who gaslights me is dismissive. It's, it's sort of focusing on the positive, like take the power now and finding the right person for yourself. Or maybe um, we can post that list. Yes. If I can we'll find it, it. We'll post account. it with credit. We but can I, also um, put it in the description of this episode. I'll make sure that happens uh, after we're wrapped. Yeah. But Maybe. it's also because then when you're talking to people about the kind of manager you want, you, you know, because people will be like, well, what do you want? Do you want someone who reps TV, film, both? Do you want somebody who knows actors who also reps director, you know, like really think about what you want in a management in a manager. So that helps. I'm not sure if I did the assignment totally, oh, but I did part on. of it. Please, please. <laughs> I'm being truthful. I did part of it and I found someone amazing. Right. And I, but I was, um, do uh, it. Do all of it, Rebecca. I'll finish the assignment. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> so that you can know that I get an A because I get an A. Okay, there you go. All right. A yeah. All right. Well, all I hope right. That the question. I think that answers the question. I oh, but but more specifically, yeah. how do you have that conversation with your manager? Like, I don't know what the words are that you say when you break I up. I think with you just them. have to be professional and say this respectful. Is Respectful. Remember, be respectful, even if they're not being respectful. You know, I, I've been thinking about it and I think this is just not working out between us. Like literally, like, can we still be friends? It's like breaking up, right? Mm -hmm. If you get a big reaction back and they yell and they, you don't deserve me and you don't know what the hell you're doing and all, they go after you. Number one, now you know for sure it was a toxic relationship and congratulations, you should not be with that person. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Number two, you've hit their ego, right? You've hurt their ego. So their big ego monster just came up to try to make you feel small again. You have to hold it, Rebecca. You have to hold it, your size and your power, and just say, I'm sorry that you feel that way. I'm sorry you feel that way. You know, I'm, I, I hear you. I hear you. I, I understand that's upsetting. I'm sorry you feel that way. Just, you know, keep it. And you can do it. It's, it, yes. it's going to be like ripping a Band-Aid off. It will, right? Yes. Just do it.